Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Hi, I'm Colonel Ken Gillum, and today on A Better Peace, we will once again venture into the Wargaming Room, a series dedicated to war games and other innovative methods used at the U.S. Army War College and other institutions for education, research, and experience. I'm glad you could join us today. Today, my guest is Mr. Ed Zakowski, call sign Cliffy, a retired Navy commander who, at the end of his active military career, taught at the Army War College. Cliffy is now a Department of the Army civilian, and part of his role is the director of the International Strategic Crisis Negotiation Exercise Program, which we will be talking about today. Cliffy, welcome to the Wargaming Room. Hey, thanks for having me. That Cliffy, I really thought about asking about the origins of your call sign, but I decided that often those are veiled in secrecy due to some unwritten rule, or they may have some questionable or unsavory origins. So to save you from any embarrassment, I'll ask our traditional opening question for first-time guests. So what was your favorite game or play activity as a kid, and do you still play it? Surprisingly, my first and favorite game was Legos. Um, I still have my original bag from when I was a child. My mom saved them for all those years. Um, do I still play them? Uh, not as much as I used to. When my children were little, we broke them out all the time and played. But now that they're grown up, I basically uh, haven't played in probably two years. Well, I think the Army War College has an opening for you with all those mountains of Lego bricks that are in there just waiting for somebody to use them. Yeah, that would be fun. Clippy, while most of the institutional energy of the Army War College is focused on the resident and non-resident senior service college students, there are some programs that reach beyond the walls of the school and may not be as well known around campus. One of those programs is the International Strategic Crisis Negotiations Exercise, which is coordinated by the Department of Strategic Wargaming. Cliffy, you're now the lead planner for those exercises, and you will play a significant lead role in them as well. Can you give us an overview of the program and maybe some of the history behind it? Certainly. Um, The exercise is set up as a two-day strategic negotiation event. Uh, We do this at uh, master's degree programs at prominent universities throughout the country. We divide the students that participate into anywhere from seven to nine teams based on the scenario that we're using. And we bring them together under the auspices of a United Nations Peace Conference. Um, with that, we bring in a retired ambassador who plays a United Nations special representative to that region for the scenario. And the students will conduct an opening and closing plenary with the ambassador. And then we end up doing a series of team meetings and then negotiation sessions. And we alternate back and forth over the two days. Um, a little bit of history on the ISNES. It started back in 2003 um, when an Army War College fellow working at Georgetown was given the responsibility of conducting an exercise. So he contacted CSL and was trying to get some help on what he could do. And the International Fellows Program at the time was doing a negotiation type exercise. So they modified it for him to use at Georgetown. This uh, was initially thought of as just being a temporary fix, a a one-off type event, and Georgetown ended up continuing it as an annual event because they had such success with it. Later in 2007, an ambassador was stopping through the War College en route to Princeton, and he was talking to the lead um, director at CSL, and he asked whether they had any type of exercises that could be used with his graduate students that he was going to have up at Princeton. Uh, when they described what the ISNI was to him, he really loved it. And so began the expansion of the ISNI program. Um, at that time, we had Georgetown and Princeton, and we continued that relationship with those schools for a number of years. So, Cliffy, I hear you telling me a lot of advantages for the other schools. How does the program itself 
connect back to the Army War College mission? And what are you trying to accomplish with the program for the Army War College? Well, it actually fits in with one of the lines of effort that the Army War College has, which is that of uh, outreach and external service. Uh, through the engagements that we have in the SNE program with the various schools, we first of all promote the Army War College in the education that we do. And then we also are exposing those future diplomats or policymakers um, to somebody in the military, because we usually bring a colonel and a major along with us for the exercise. So they get exposure to um, those military folks that are actually working at the Army War College. And surprisingly, a lot of them actually have never met someone in the military. They don't have family members or friends that have served. So that allows us to, again, show them a different side of the military than they might have seen in a movie or TVs or on the news. So um, that's, you know, our biggest thing is to, you know, outreach to show a side of the military that these uh, students have never seen. But also when they get into those positions of being, you know, uh, working in an embassy or maybe an NGO, the first time that they come in contact with the United States military, um, we don't want that to be in a hostile situation or a, a situation where um, the military is being used. So in this peacetime situation, we can actually um, you know, introduce them to the U.S. military in a small fashion and, uh, and expose them to what we do. Cliffy, what are some of the scenarios that you work with? Currently, we have eight scenarios. Uh, the, the prominent ones are Nagorno-Karabakh, which is the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. We also do Sudan and South Sudan, uh, Jammu and Kashmir in the uh, northern regions of Pakistan and India, which actually has been pretty hot lately. And uh, the South China Sea is, uh, is our uh, predominant one that we do lately, and it gets over all of the land conflicts uh, claims in the South China Sea. What about some of the schools? Um, well, currently we exercise at 13 different universities. Um, some examples, the Ford School up at the University of Michigan, Patterson School at the University of Kentucky, the LBJ School at the University of Texas at Austin, and the Corbell School at the University of Denver. We do have one law school that participates in this every year, and that is the Carey Law School at the University of Pennsylvania. So you didn't talk about Georgetown there. They were one of your original participants. How's that going now? Uh, we stopped uh, exercising at Georgetown a few years ago. Um, they wanted to take their uh, course and program into a different uh, region. They do a, an exercise similar to the ISTE, but they do it as an entire course, um, and it's spread out over an entire semester, so it really couldn't fit into what we do in the two days, and we couldn't support as best as we would like to. Do you count that as a a win or a loss for the Army War College? Actually, I consider it, um, well, I guess it'd be a win and a loss. I mean, it's a loss because we don't get that exposure to those students that are coming through. But I think it's a win because they've taken the program that was developed at the Army War College, and now they've expanded it to an entire course. It's actually a, a prerequisite for their master's program in foreign policy and foreign relations. So, you know, something that we put out, um, you know, I guess it's 24 years ago, or excuse me, 18 years ago, um, has now blossomed into an actual course for a graduation requirement. So instead of me asking the standard question about what were some of the student reactions, and we get into this circle of mutual admiration, I will grant you that the students generally appreciate and are enthusiastic about what you're doing. But I want you, if you can, to provide me some examples of some negative student reactions when you run these exercises. Well, when we get the student feedbacks, I'll start off with that first. They really don't um, show anything negative towards uh, the exercise per se. The things that they comment on are that they wish that they had more time with their team to develop their strategy, wish that they had more time in team meetings, again, to review what has happened uh, during the negotiations, um, and they wish that they had more time to negotiate. But we purposefully compress the schedule to add that level of um, pressure to them. And so getting that feedback is actually a good thing. Um, some other negative things that we find is that there is too much material. We try to provide a very in-depth scenario with not only current and relevant events, but the history behind them. And some of our packets of material can be upwards of you know 60 or 70 or uh, even up to 90 pages. We don't expect them to read all of it, but it's there for their 
a reference um, so that they can be more, you know, armed and prepared. So we find that students get overwhelmed by the amount of information we try to put into their toolkit. Is the overwhelming part of the information, is that helpful for the exercise from your standpoint with, when you're running the exercise? Does that help simulate the environment those students are going to be in if they were a, a diplomat trying to do something similar in the real world? I think it is because uh, most of the students are uh, United States citizens, you know, U.S. born, and they're not used to understanding history as the rest of the world sees it. You know, take the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh um, exercise that we do. There are things in this scenario that are literally hundreds, if not a thousand years old, that people in those regions still draw from. Um, they still reference in their, you know, interactions with each other whether it was the time under Ottoman control or the time under Russian control or whatever. And so for the students to see that this is a historical thing that is building and is still relevant today, I think allows them to get better into the role and to understand the team that they're playing or the team that they're going against. And they quickly learn um, once the exercise kicks off that that other person sitting across the table um, has a different story, has a different background based on the scenario materials that they get. And so now they have to realize, oh my gosh, I remember reading that, you know, on page 60 and now it's relevant because it's in a conversation that I'm having in this negotiation. Can you give me an idea of how they interact with each other inside of the exercises uh, and how you structure it and how you force them to have those conversations and come to the table? Yeah, so we start off um, with an exercise overview like most exercises do, and then we jump them into role. And so the initial plenary session, the United Nations ambassador that is there, and we use real um, retired ambassadors to do this, they have each of the, the nations or delegations give an opening statement. And this kind of sets the tone for the whole um, exercise because you're not sure what a nation or a head of delegation is going to say. Then we have the uh, delegations go back to a team meeting room. And it's, so it's just their team and they work on their strategy. And then how we kind of kickstart the exercise when, for the negotiations is the first negotiation period, we set up bilateral negotiations. So we kind of force feed the students who they're going to meet with. And, you know, this kind of, it, it takes the cobwebs off. It kind of, you know, breaks the rust off because they're not sure exactly how they're going to approach this game. Um, but then after that, they go back to a team meeting and now they can review what they learned in these various negotiations. And part of the structure of this is that we don't allow the teams to just go to one negotiation. Um, they might have two or three or potentially four negotiations to go to at the same time. And then they'll have a follow on um, again, three or four negotiations in the next 15 minutes after. And so when they get back to their team meeting, they might have as much as, you know, six or eight different conversations that they now have to piece together and see how it fits in their strategy and where they need to make adjustments. And then we allow the students themselves to actually, as teams, um, invite other delegations to future meetings. But of course, you can invite the other team does not necessarily have to accept. And what we see sometimes is the students will react differently to a team that declines an invitation or a team that ignores an invitation. And sometimes they take that as a negative and that drives their viewpoint towards that other delegation. And it might take them down a rabbit hole that, uh, you know, they might already have a hostile relationship with somebody that they haven't met with yet. And uh, so there's a lot of those dynamics in the game that, uh, you know, once they get through that first initial negotiations, it's on, on to them. And then those dynamic things start to play. A little bit earlier, you talked about schools using this for their purposes and some might actually use them as a, a graduate requirement for their programs. Can you talk through some of the things that those professors are trying to achieve inside of their program using your exercise? Yes. For um, the University of Pennsylvania at the Cary Law School, it is a two credit course and they're um, required to take an experiential learning um, elective in order to graduate. So their, um, their team of faculty um, that, that brought the ISNI to them uh, through us, uh, they are looking to teach on international law when it comes to um, the South China Sea. So they look at the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. And so they have lecture series set up 
and um, guest speakers that come in and discuss this topic with the students. And then we get into the two day exercise and they have to write an impact paper. Um, so there, the professors use the exercise as kind of a an expression of here's the UN conventional law of the sea and how these nations are all um, at odds with it in their own day-to-day -day interactions. Uh, up in the University of Washington, they have a whole course on um, negotiations and diplomacy. And so we fit into the tail end of their course as kind of their um, you know, capstone exercise. So there they've been in you know, class the entire semester learning negotiation techniques, learning about the diplomatic world and how it operates. And then we come in with our exercise at the end and basically dovetail into whatever topic they're discussing based on one of our scenarios. And now they get a chance to actually use the uh, techniques and the systems that they've learned in their class. Sounds a little bit complicated. How big of a team does the Army War College bring in to help a school run one of these things? It's a lot smaller than you think. Um, we usually bring three people. There is um, usually an Army colonel who is the exercise director, and his or her responsibility is to oversee the exercise as a whole, make sure that it's you know moving along as we've designed it. I play the senior controller. Um, in my role, I am the foreign minister or secretary of state of every country there. And so I get to interact with the students and hopefully from the internal side of it, keep them you know, marching towards a common goal of trying to solve this issue. And then we usually have a major or potentially a captain that is what we call in the UN control group, but it's a communications group. And that person mo uh, monitors an application that we have um, that helps the students schedule um, ad hoc negotiation periods. And also um, he monitors an email um, in case they want to send any type of um, communications between delegations so that we can monitor those. We rely a lot on the universities themselves to provide uh, the ambassador, to provide mentors for each of the teams. Uh, most of the schools, uh, actually almost all, but I think one, provide at least one mentor and a lot of them two mentors per, per team. And so it ends up being a larger organization that executes it. But from the Army War College, it's a it's a army of three that go on and do these. Anything coming up this year? or new scenarios, new schools, or how are you branching out, trying to get bigger, or trying to get better? Well, the new scenario front, um, in the fall, I wrote one on the Arctic. We've been having some interest in that from a variety of sources, whether it's universities or internal to uh, the Army War College. So I've developed an Arctic scenario. And then this summer, we're looking at developing a Western Sahara scenario, um, which we think could bring in uh, quite a dynamic and a little different tinge to things where we don't necessarily have the United States always there or some big power player. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, for this year coming up, we are slated to do the 13 schools that we did last year. Um, that is pretty much all we can do, maybe 15 if we were lucky, um, but the schedule fills up and we're basically on the road constantly. Now this year, obviously we've had Zoom for most of our stuff, but we're hoping for academic year 22 that we'll be back on the road. Um, and when you're traveling, you know, six to seven weekends out of a semester, um, it starts to, to weigh on you. But, you know, we'll see how the, the schools, um, the ones that we have, we're very proud of and proud to be affiliated with. If they want to continue to uh, exercise with us, we'll do that. And if we can potentially get new schools, then uh, we'll work those in um, as the manpower and time uh, permits. So how did the virtual delivery go this year? You said you did some of them by remote means? Yeah, it's it's a different animal. Um, as everyone knows in the current environment that, you know, virtual is, is not as uh, personable as being in person. Um, but what we have found is the students use back channel communications a lot more because while they're facing a camera, they can be on their Google Docs or on their WhatsApp or you know, texting somebody from their team. So we see that teams will now have a notes taker and a speaker in these negotiations. And then there's somebody that's you know real time talking to another delegation and they're getting notes about what was said in another meeting. And then they can use that for armament. So those kinds of things we you know, never were um, privy to or actually didn't happen when it was in person because you're in a closed room 
Um, nothing gets in, nothing gets out until you walk out of the room. And so that aspect of it has really, um, I think, in some way sharpened the students because now they can, you know, call each other out. If one of the delegation members says one thing and another one says something else, they can call them out real time. But it also, it's amazing to see the students um, multitasking. You know, they are literally communicating on three, four, five different either applications or devices. And some people might think that's a distraction, but when you see the product and how they're actually engaging with the other students, they're coming in with a lot more knowledge. They're coming in, you know, armed and ready to negotiate and not having to feel their way through it. Um, they already know what they want to, you know, get from this negotiation. Of course, they meet with another delegate from another team and it might not go as well, but they seem to be really well prepared. Um, so it's, you know, we've worked out some of the kinks that we had the first couple of times we did it, but right now, um, I think it's a, a very viable way to execute this type of an exercise. Excellent. How do you decide which schools are going to be in the portfolio and which aren't? And if a school wants to join and wants to partner with the Army War College to do this, how do they, what's their entry point? How do they get into the in crowd? Well, I'll start with the first part. Um, the schools that we are trying to get with or that we desire to exercise with are in the top 25 um, rated in foreign policy or the U.S. News um, you know, college rankings for graduate programs in foreign relations and public policy. So we try to target those schools first off. Um, we, again, if a school would like us, they can contact uh, the Center for Strategic Leadership. Um, we can, you know, they can get my phone number and contact me or my email, which we can put maybe in the uh, notes of the podcast. And then we can, you know, go off of, you know, an initial contact and maybe exploring what potential there is out there for going to that school. Um, we do have one undergraduate program that uh, I didn't mention earlier, but um, the Texas A&M University, the Student Council on National Affairs, we go down and we support their annual conference. I think this year was their 66th um, consecutive conference. Um, and they invited us a number of years ago. Um, to participate as kind of a precursor to their conference. And we've had a great relationship with them. They bring in students from all over the nation to participate in the ISNI and their SCONA conference. But other than that, all of the other schools, we really try to shoot for that top 25, you know, foreign policy and international relations uh, programs. So what about those Army War College colonels that are listening in and they think, hey, that's pretty cool. How do I get to do that? Are they able to participate or do you go to like one or two people to be your exercise director? Um, if they're active duty at the Army War College, um, they can participate in this. Again, we have, you know, 13 a year. So um, we're always looking to, you know, fill in um, for the home team. So with that, they can again contact me and we'd be happy to give them a brief um, since we're on Zoom currently, if they'd like to uh, watch one and see what we do, that would be fine. When we go back to in-person, that'll all just depend on, you know, TDY dollars and whether we need to bring um, that new kernel along with another kernel. Um, but we have had success with folks doing it the first time because as an exercise director, you don't necessarily have to know the scenario insides and out. You just have to, you know, recognize when things are kind of going off the rails or if some guidance needs to be uh, driven in one way or another. And then one of the primary things that our kernels do is they conduct an after action review. And just like, you know, exercises and training opportunities that they've done their whole career, they just have to take what they witnessed and observed and then try to glean some learning points from it and then get those inputs from the students. Um, if someone is not an active duty colonel or someone that is on active duty at the Army War College, um, they just have to contact us and we can, again, try to find a way. Um, we'd be more than happy to have you. Another way that they can serve is some of the schools are always looking for mentors. And again, kind of like I said earlier about getting um, the face of the military in front of these students, having a military member as a mentor um, can bring, you know, a wealth of personal um, knowledge. You know, you've probably been deployed around the world, so you've seen other places outside of America and understand how people think and think differently than we do. Um, and so we can use it as a mentor at one of the schools if you desire to do that. Okay, I, thanks for your time. I have done a couple of these myself, both from the mentor and the exercise director 
And it's a personally rewarding, professionally developmental exercise to me as an officer and helped me really appreciate the up and coming diplomats that are out there and gave me an opportunity, I think, to affect them and to learn quite a bit. Is there anything that we didn't cover today you think we should cover that the audience might need to be aware of? Um, I don't know whether they need to be aware of this, but you mentioned that, you know, you've done a couple of these. Um, my own story on this, when I exercised the ISDs back uh, six and seven years ago, I was so impressed by the exercise and the students and the interactions. And I was working a contract job when I saw that this Department of the Army civilian job came available and it was doing the ISD program. And I jumped on it as quickly as possible because I remember how rewarding it was. And then to be involved in it as now the director is actually, I say, a dream come true when it comes to uh, you know doing a job for the Army War College. I, I love doing it. Um, and I think that when people experience it, they have a great appreciation for what we're doing for these students. And they're also very impressed by the students, which is what drove me to want to do this job. It's a blessing to have a job that you're passionate about and you see some value that being delivered on the day to day. And Cliffy, I think we're about out of time for today. Thanks for talking and best of luck as you continue to grow and deliver quality exercises all across the nation. And thanks to all of you for joining us in the war gaming room. Please send us your comments on this and all the programs, including ideas for future programs. If you want to hear more, subscribe to A Better Peace. After you've subscribed, please rate and review this podcast on your podcatcher of choice because that helps others find us as well. We're also seeking articles for publication in the Wargaming Room series, so send us your pitch for innovative and provocative wargaming content intended for a broad audience of well-informed leaders and listeners, including other governmental, business, and education audiences. We'll see you here next time, but until then, from the Wargaming Room, I'm Ken Gillum. Play to win. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.